Okay, good evening. I'm Mike Lignatiev, Rector and President of Central European University. Um, this is uh, a lecture, um, a President's Lecture in our Reasons for Hope series by Susan Nyman. Susan, I have known for a very long time. Susan is the director of one of the most interesting institutes in Berlin, uh, the Einstein Forum, which is a kind of model of its kind. It's a place where um, intellectuals, writers, academics, journalists, thinkers of all kinds have met for 20 years thanks to Susan's ecumenical approach to intellectual life. And um, she is um, an American, born in the South, which is, I think, might be relevant in the discussion, um, has lived in Germany 20, 25 years, a substantial part of time. So she's a very rare person, someone who is both a distinguished American philosopher trained at uh, uh, Harvard and at Princeton, and also a extremely important cultural communicator in uh, the German-speaking world. And she has written books that have had a lot of effect on me and on lots of people. Evil in Modern Thought is a very important study about evil and how we think about evil in the modern philosophical tradition. After 9-11, when people began calling for moral clarity, she wrote an extremely important book called Moral Clarity, taking up the challenge of what moral clarity actually looked like in the wake of that catastrophic eruption into the 21st century. And she's now written, I think, an extremely interesting book called Learning from the Germans. I won't begin to summarize it, but just so you have the frame of the discussion or what she's been trying to do. She's thought deeply and at length about the German encounter with the Nazi past and with the communist past. They're not the same. We just, before, the, before we came down, she was making the point that the conflation of these two types of regime has been a source of confusion. So keeping everything is what it is and not another thing, as a philosopher famously said, but how West Germany and East Germany have, and both Germanys together, have worked through the experience of these two historical experiences is one focus of her reflection. But the other is to think about the American encounter with slavery. Uh, and I can't think of a book that's put all of this together. Um, explosively difficult and controversial reflection about um, historical iner inheritances which have in shaped uh, Germany uh, and continue to shape um, the United States, so that you discover, here's the historian speaking, that one of the things about the past, which we need to teach our students, is the past is never over. The past is never securely and finally and irrevocably, uh, irrevocably in the past. And Susan Nyman is gonna talk to us about what she's learned about how Two societies in particular have learned from the past and how we can all learn from the Germans. And I bid you, Susan, a very, very warm welcome. Welcome to see you. I'm actually wondering if I can just <laughs> use, use this mic and then when we sit down, I can use a different mic. Everybody can hear me, right? Yeah, are you okay yeah. over there? Good. Yeah. Okay, great. Michael, thank you for those lovely words about my work. I'm um, honored and touched. And I was very happy to accept your invitation to talk about my new uh, book until the time got closer to writing a talk. And then I started feeling daunted 
Uh, I've spent most of the last three months talking about it in places as distant as Edinburgh and California. And as I was saying before, I was happily surprised at how receptive audiences were. But I suspect that nowhere on earth are people more adverse to learning from the Germans than Austria. The general resentment Austria expresses towards Germany, of course, has, like most cases of resentment, more than one cause. But if you've spent much time in Austria, you know as well as I do that it's there. Much of it's connected to an observation made by my late husband, who uh, spent most of his adult life in Vienna, and said, how can one expect Austrians to come to terms with the Second World War when they haven't even come to terms with the first one? It's a witty way of putting a complicated truth. Austria seems stuck between a melancholy nostalgia for empire and a robustly provincial form of nationalism. Among left-leaning Austrians, uh, the nostalgia is for the bubbling multiculturalism of the Ka and Ka. Uh, among right-leaning Austrians, of course, uh, you know where it leads. Um, but if the wounds of the First World War and the fact that Austria lost so much more of its territory than did its neighbor to the north have yet to heal, the wounds of the Second are worse. When the Allies decided, for their own political reasons, to accept Austria's claim to being Hitler's first victim, I suspect they felt they had to act the part. The old joke says that an Austrian is someone who wants to convince you that uh, Hitler was born in Germany and Beethoven was born in Vienna. Um, but it's not really funny. Showing hostility to post-war Germany is a way of concealing, perhaps especially to oneself, how happy most Austrians were to be annexed in 1938. Given such deep uncertainty, at best, about its own identity, it's not surprising that Austria's attitude towards its closest relation makes the idea of learning from it distasteful. But of course, we're not just in Vienna, but we're also sort of in Budapest, <laughs> I, which is even less inclined to examine its own sins and more interested in focusing on its own suffering. I won't pretend to know enough about the current situation in Hungary to speak about it intelligently. I will say that its attitude is a natural one and probably universal. Until the mid-20th century, most nations formed their identities by focusing on their most heroic achievements. When it wasn't the winning of glorious battles, it was the creation of great literature and art. Focusing on one's own victimhood was not seen as a way to build identity, either individual or national, with the possible exception of the Jews and the Poles. But since the Second World War at the latest, remembrance and valorization of national suffering has become a very common way of strengthening national bonds. There is another option. And it's the road the Germans have largely taken, acknowledging national crimes. They've invented several compound words for the process. The first one I learned was Vergangenheitsbewältigung, uh, a suggestion that the past could be mastered or overcome. It's fallen out of use because most thoughtful Germans uh, reject that suggestion. The idea that there's anything one could do to make the past go away once and for all is too final, too arrogant. The term most commonly in use today is Erinnerungskultur, memory culture, which is a word I emphatically reject because it's uh, euphemistic. Every culture has a memory culture, whether it's memory of Habsburg glory or the Battle of Waterloo. What's actually meant by Erinnerungskultur is the insistence on bad memories, even shameful memories. So. I much prefer the term Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, working off the past, because it implies that the past can and should be worked off the way you work off a debt. 
It also implies that for all but the very wealthy, debts must be worked off slowly and incrementally, like mortgages. Unless you're a billionaire, a one-off payment is rarely enough. Beginning in the 60s, not quite a majority, but a very loud minority of educated young Germans insisted that they and their nation needed to work off the Nazi past. Perhaps it's relevant here that the German word for schuld, guilt, is almost the same word as debts, schulden. Now, this was not a popular position, and most people outside Germany are shocked to learn that for decades after the war, most West Germans did not feel they needed to atone or work off anything at all. In fact, they saw themselves as the world's, as the war's worst victims, the world's worst victims too, as a matter of fact. After all, their cities had been reduced to rubble, their territory dismembered, seven million of their citizens killed, millions of men who survived were prisoners of war, humiliated by those they'd despised and thought to conquer. The first po post-war years were marked by hunger and cold, so intense that the trees which had lined city streets for a hundred years were felled to keep the residents from freezing to death. And on top of it all, the occupiers of the two nations they most detested, the subhuman Russians and the vulgar Yankees, were trying to tell them that the war was their fault. It's easy for even good historians, like uh, the former British Museum director Neil McGregor, who did a whole series on Germany with the BBC, and entirely missed the undertone of self-pity that permeated post-war Germany. It took me decades of living to grasp it. Having now grasped it, I've begun to ask German friends why, when I arrived in Berlin in 1982, people were perfectly willing to tell me their parents were Nazis, but no one let on that their parents were Nazis and they considered themselves to be the war's worst victims. The latter seems to me to be more outrageous. And so I've asked if it was a matter of shame. Was it something that people simply were ashamed to admit? And several people said no. Uh, it seems so obvious that no one ever bothered to mention it. Of course we were the war's worst victims. We lost it, after all. I suppose competition for the fully unearned title of being the war's worst victims is an undercurrent of the rancor that Austria feels for Germany. Outside Austrian Germany, people have been slow in acknowledging post-war German sense of victimhood because the one picture of post-war Germany that captured international attention was the one we all wanted to see, Willy Brandt on his knees before the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial. We didn't know that Brandt's gesture was unique. Brandt himself had done nothing he needed to atone for. The committed social democrat fled Germany for Norway a few months after the Nazis came to power. We did not know that this act, which made him a good German in the eyes of the world, made him a bad German in the eyes of most of Germany. The most powerful party, the Christian Democrats, had no qualms about using Brandt's self-imposed exile as a campaign slogan against him. What was Herr Brandt doing abroad for 12 years? We know what we were doing in Germany. That's an original Konrad Adenauer. One of the reasons I've yet to forgive the Christian Democrats <laughs> is that they haven't done any Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung on that one at all. Still, when he became chancellor, Brandt felt he had a responsibility to atone for the crimes of the nation he represented. The spontaneous act of kneeling admired by other nations was one reason his tenure as chancellor was cut short, although it wasn't the official reason. In 1970, most of West Germany saw no need for what today would be called an apology tour, and certainly no submissive gesture before the Slavs who had never been viewed as a f people of equals. Far more typical of West Germany uh, was the Christian Democrat Helmut Kohl, who famously insisted that he benefited from the mercy of a late birth. No sane person would ascribe personal responsibility to someone like Kohl, who was three years old when the Nazis took power. 
For him and his contemporaries, uh, therefore, the slate was wiped clean, and he could represent a new Germany unencumbered by the past. When he argued this in 1983, Cole was so sharply criticized for the expression that he took it back uh, seven years later, though his weak kneed attempt to explain his earlier use of mercy of a late birth convinced no one. For a change in consciousness begun in the 60s had begun to take hold among Germans who recognized the slate would never be clean unless they scrubbed a lot harder. And if you think I'm overworking a metaphor, you should know that for decades, uh, those who advanced working off the past were called Nestbeschmutzer, people who dirty their own nests. The nest Bishmutzer replied that the dirt was already there, stinking to high heaven, and could no longer be swept under the carpet. Now, if you've been to Berlin, you've probably seen the Holocaust Memorial, a, sim a monument the size of four football fields next to Brandenburg Gate, which is the symbolic center of reunited Germany. You're less likely to have seen any of Berlin's other 422 monuments to the victims of Nazi crimes, some of which are more interesting, but no matter. One of the leaders of Germany's new right-wing party, the AFD, complained that no other nation in the world has planted a monument of shame in the heart of its nation's capital. He's right to say that no other nation has done it and wrong to complain about that. Germany's decision to remember its criminal past should be a matter for precarious pride, although my German editor has asked me to find another word besides pride, oh, and I'm working on it. it. It's true. The shame lies in the crimes, not the marking of them. This is now a consensus, though it's a consensus the radical right is working to undermine. What I want to emphasize is how hard that consensus was to achieve, pace Willy Brandt. It took decades of struggle, often intergenerational struggle, to force changes in notions of citizenship, governmental policies, educational systems, and physical iconography. It's a struggle that was often personally wrenching because the insistence on facing one's parents' crime seems to conflict with the duty to respect your parents simply because they are your parents. Of course, cultures differ widely in their views of the scope of that duty. Traditional cultures extend it to respecting your parents' wish for your own wishes for your own life, what profession you should enter or whom you should marry. But all cultures presuppose some respect for your parents simply because because parenting uh, at its most basic, keeping small, helpless beings alive until they're able to live on their own, is bloody hard work. <laughs> I have three. Uh, it would be even, <laughs> they're all grown though. It would be even harder work without the presumption that respect and gratitude are owed to the person or persons who do that work. In extreme cases of abuse, think of incest or hard violence, parents may forfeit their right to be respected. Extreme cases, so what if your parents were Nazis? This was a dilemma faced by most thoughtful Germans of my generation, give or take a decade or so. Dates mattered, as did exact biographies. Those whose fathers were drafted, for example, but served as medical orderlies had the easiest time of it. Some, like the son of Hans Frank, the Nazi official who governed most of German-occupied Poland, has written about privately celebrating the date of his father's execution in a way that's obscene. One can hardly imagine the clashes in this man's soul torn between the duty to respect and mourn the people who sired us, and the knowledge that his father was truly one who could never claim to only have been following orders. But even those whose parents were less culpable felt contaminated by their parents' sins. Only those who truly resisted Nazi crimes were not complicit in them, and most of those who truly resisted were dead. It's significant that many West Germans of that generation chose not to have children themselves, largely because their notions of family and authority, respect and responsibility, had become so conflicted. 
Some Germans, such as Bernhard Schlink, author of the dreadful, albeit best-selling novel, The Reader, even argued that the only way a German can escape her Nazi parents' guilt is to break with them entirely, and many did. In order to restore some sense of health to the chain that binds parents and children, working off their parents' debts was unavoidable. Most states require that debts be paid before deceased persons' assets are distributed to their heirs. It's a legal obligation you can only avoid by refusing to accept an inheritance at all, which isn't even possible in every case. This aspect of law is based on intuitions about fairness. You have no right to enjoy the benefits of inheritance and reject its liabilities. Unlike personal property, historical debt can rarely be quantified. Yet the intuition embodied in the law is one we're right to preserve. Our relation to our nations, of course, is not exactly analogous to our relation to our parents, though I'll come back to it later, but the analogy is strong enough to be useful. We all benefit from inheritance we didn't ask for and can only partially reject, if at all. Those include most crucially being born into a particular culture with all the history and social structures that implies. Now, no material payment can compensate for the suffering inflicted by slavery. No one who has read a thorough description of slavery in Auschwitz or in Alabama would prefer it, no matter the compensation, to never having been enslaved at all. The Austrian Jewish philosopher and writer Jean Marie, one of my heroes, if you don't know him, you should read him, who was imprisoned in Auschwitz for two years, wrote that the only thing that could make up for those crimes would be turning back time and undoing them. For those who know their Nietzsche, he actually takes Nietzsche's point about resentment and says, yes, absolutely, we want to turn back time. The only way to solve the problem, he concluded, was by permitting resentment to remain alive in the one camp and aroused by its self-mistrust in the other. If this took place, Germans would have integrated Auschwitz into their natural history rather than allowing it to be neutralized by time. Amory himself, a man of exquisite moral sensibility, did not apply for the reparations he was owed, despite the fact that his material situation after the liberation was anything but solid. In fact, the roughly 80 billion marks that West Germany paid to Holocaust victims were only uh, accompanied by a half-hearted apology wrested from Adenauer by the Israelis, who virtually dictated what he wrote. The reparations paid by East Germany to Poland and the Soviet Union were forced, though it's telling that the, with a resolutely anti-fascist government in power, many East Germans thought the reparations were fair. In his first speech to Parliament in 1949, Adenauer had lamented the wartime suffering of a long list of Germans, those who lost their homes to annexation or bombing, those interned in POW camps, those who were widowed or crippled. Before entering into talks about the correct sums, therefore, Israel insisted that Adenauer make a formal statement uh, to Parliament admitting German culpability for crimes against the Jewish people. It's sort of incredible to think in the 50s that this was the object of negotiation, but it was. The Jews wanted more acknowledgement of guilt, the Germans wanted less, and what emerged was a compromise. Still, the apology was historic, as were the payment of reparations. In making those payments, however, Adenauer's government made an implicit bargain. In paying money to our victims, we have finished the process of working off the past. We can turn our faces away from the shameful pa pages of our history, make no attempt to remove former Nazis from our government, our schools, our cultural institutions, and consider accounts settled. It's important that almost 50 years after Adenauer's agreement, the newly elected Social Democratic Green government um, created a foundation funded both by government and by industry that not only paid reparations for the slave laborers who had not yet been compensated, mostly because they lived in Eastern Europe, 
The foundation also set aside funds for projects to remember the past in Eastern Europe and calls itself memory, responsibility, and future. So in 1966, Amory quoted a man who told him that reparations payments mean that the Germans bear the Jews no grudges. I want you to sort of pause on that sentence. Um, under those circumstances, it's understandable that he refused to take those payments. He was waiting for the genuine remorse that did not come until after he died by his own hand. Now, half a century after Amory's book was, uh, this is, he wrote many books, but this one is called Jenseits von Schuld und Sühne, translated as At the Mind's Limits. It's his discussion of Auschwitz and torture and resentment. Uh, the interesting thing about Amory is that he wrote must much, much of his other work uh, is a passionate defense of the Enlightenment. So, um, but in that book, he doubted that the Germans would ever actually um, turn around. Uh, and today I think it's hard to find a German who does not wish to turn time around and undo Nazi crimes, even if only to avoid the decades of national shame that followed. The remorse is genuine. The length of time it took for West Germans to acknowledge that, actually, there were other people who had a better claim to being the, world, the war's worst victims, the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust or the 14 million Soviet citizens starved or slaughtered on the Eastern Front, makes many Germans today reluctant to acknowledge that German Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung has done more than scratched the surface. In the kind of Berlin circles I inhabit, which I suppose should be described as uh, educated and center-left leaning, the very best reaction to the title of my book so far has been a kind of astonished laughter. And I've been yelled at more than once for the idea that the rest of the world has anything to learn from Germany. I sometimes respond by saying this very reaction reveals the attitude that proves my point. The insistence on self-criticism, the claim that Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung hasn't gone deep or far enough, betrays a commitment to relentless self-criticism that's nearly impossible to find in other countries. My book focused on the ways the US has been painfully slow to ra uh, face its racist past, but examples from Britain are particularly instructive. Twice in two days, I was told on British television that Britain had nothing to learn from the German example because Nazism was about world domination. Having had the presence of mind in the first program to mutter, I thought the sun never set on the British Empire. Um, in the first show, I could repeat it in the second, but I'm still astonished by so little self-awareness as well as by a peculiar sense of timing when the moderator continued that, after all, colonialism was also very long ago. I shouldn't have had to be the one to point out that Britain lost its colonies after the war. Let me emphasize, I am not arguing that British colonialism or American slavery was exactly like Nazi domination. No two historical events are exactly alike, and I spent actually the first chapter of my book pointing out all the differences. I'm less interested in comparing historical evils than in comparing historical redemption. And considering redemption, the Germans are simply ahead of the rest. If it's because they had more to atone for, that's no reason to let the rest of us off the hook. But what about the AfD, the AfD? The recent em emergence of a radical right-wing party, the first since the war to win enough votes to enter parliament, has led many inside and particularly outside Germany uh, to question whether the German effort to face its past has been pointless. Originally founded as an obscure little party opposed to the Euro, the AFD has grown since the refugee crisis on a platform that opposes both refugees and Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung. 
Several of its leaders have made deliberately provocative remarks intended to rehabilitate the Wehrmacht. While their demonstrations, especially when violent, receive lots of international press, <clears throat> the opposition to them rarely gets the same attention. The 4,000 rioters in Chemnitz last fall were front page news in many countries. The 67,000 who gathered in peaceful protest 10 days later were not. That the IFD is opposed to refugees and asylum seekers is well known, but even the German press pays little attention to the fact that far more Germans are still actively engaged in refugee integration, volunteering to teach German or help with bu bureaucracy, playing music or soccer with children and taking people into their homes, than voted for the AFD. This is a study of the renowned Allensbach Institute. This is not questionable. Oddly enough, given how rare it's said to be, good news, Israeli news. Now, the position I'm taking walks a very fine line, and it also depends on positionality. If a German were to say all the things I just said, it would make me nervous. <laughs> um, wait a second. I have lost my pages. Here I go. Um, I've been deeply influenced by a remark of the Bulgarian-French critic Tsveton Todorov, who said, the Germans should talk about the singularity of the Holocaust and Jews should talk about its universality. This is not a paradox. As the philosophy of language has taught us, statements are about more than their truth values. They're also forms of action. A German who speaks of the singular evil of the Holocaust is taking responsibility for it. Were she to speak of its universality, and many did for the first years after the war, it would be a denial of responsibility under the mantra, oh well, everybody does it. A Jew who speaks of the singularity of the Holocaust runs the risk of claiming that her people's suffering is worse than any others. A Jew who speaks of its universality has her eye out for other suffering as well. As a universalist Jew, I'm committed to watching for signs of racism wherever they occur. I am worried about the rise of right-wing nationalism in Germany, and I'm very glad that the Germans are even more worried than I am because they're in a better position to do something about it. But I think it needs to be seen in context. Right-wing nationalism is on the rise all over the world, and I'm more worried about that than about its rise in a country where it once had the deadliest consequences. There is only one alternative to nationalism, and that is universalism. It should be clear, but it often isn't, that universalism is compatible with deep respect for local traditions. But few things are more suspect than universalism today. On the left, universalism is repeatedly confused with its counterfeit. Critics point out that from Enlightenment philosophers through the American founding fathers to the Kiplings of the 19th century, white men made claims to universality while ignoring the existence of most of the planet. The philosophers of the Enlightenment, however, were the first to create the concept of Eurocentrism and in creating it to condemn it. Montesquieu wrote his critiques of European government from the imagined viewpoints of the Persians. Christian Wolf lost his job and very nearly his head for arguing that the Chinese had perfectly good ethics, though they didn't have Christianity. Diderot con criticized European sexual mores from the perspective of Tahiti. Kant called colonialism evil, a word he rarely used. And Rousseau complained that Europe knew nothing of the vast continent of Africa because its report came from travelers more interested in filling their pockets than their heads. All these men, they were all men, wrote of other nations and genders with a brevity and ignorance we now find appalling, but they were on the right track. Those philosophers made statements 
were right to regard as racist and sexist for all they tried to rise above them, they shared prejudices of their day. They remained necessary thinkers because they nevertheless built the foundations to destroy those prejudices, not only with abstract commitments to universal justice, but with their nascent attempts to address Eurocentrism by looking at Europe through other, through other albeit male, eyes. If universalism is often dismissed in today's academy, few outside are willing to defend it either. There are two historical reasons for this, and both revolve around the year 1989. After the collapse of state socialism, appeals to universal solidarity were associated with Stalinism. Ironically, in addition to his many other offenses, Stalin was deeply nationalist, the root of his battle with Trotsky, whom he erased from history with some success. But still, references to international solidarity were routinely invoked until the Soviet Union collapsed. Hardly anyone mourns its demise, but the idea of state socialism served to expand our moral imagination. The now common view that the rot that infected the Soviet Union dooms any attempt to create socialism has shrunk our imagination to a point where we can hardly envision more than mending the neoliberalism that replaced it. And the second reason follows from the first. After 1989, universalism was replaced with globalism. Since the end of state socialism, the visible faces of Universalism are the owners of Apple and Amazon and Facebook and other corporations hoping to imitate their success. The neoliberal globalist ethos has nothing to do with universal values and everything to do with universal needs, however manipulatively they may be created. For neoliberals, universal human happiness is assured by the collection of stuff. The problem of neoliberalism is not only its the fact that its aversion to economic regulation has created the greatest wealth gap in modern times, the deeper philosophical problem is its view of human nature reve revealed, I've got my, revealed in neoliberal assumptions that economic growth is the key to human happiness, though that's rarely stated so baldly particularly in view of the climate crisis, we need to th rethink the apparently harmless word growth with its organic tones and its antonym decay. Who could possibly be against it? Sustainable development just doesn't cut it, um, but that's a um, uh, subject for another discussion. For even those who belong to the 1% know the meaning of life can't be found in stockpiles of gadgets and baubles. Neoliberalism makes passive consumption rather than active engagement the fundamental human stance towards the world. Though I admired much of Obama's presidency, his acceptance of neoliberalism proved a major flaw, not only because it resulted in bailing out Wall Street at the expense of Main Street, but because it conflicted with his own philosophical ideals. Obama encouraged an active concept of human nature and citizenship, urging his followers to civic engagement with slogans like, we are the change we've been waiting for. Unless they're thoroughly undone by despair, human beings have a need to act in the world, leaving it better in some way than they found it. The worldview of neoliberalism, by contrast, treats us all at bottom as couch centered passive consumers. This worldview has been supported in the last decades by the biological determinism encouraged by pseudoscientific versions of evolutionary psychology. To read an ordinary newspaper, it's just common sense to explain all human behavior by reference to our earliest ancestors' attempts to reproduce themselves. Seldom is it asked what evidence we have for our ancestors' motivation or how much of what drove hunters and gatherers to action is relevant today. Biological determinism is so widely accepted, finally a scientific explanation of human behavior, is the idea, that its premises are rarely questioned. Finally and fatally, 
Both neoliberalism and biological determinism are reinforced by post-structuralist assumptions about power. Like the early uh, sophists with whom Plato argued, they've done us a service by showing how many claims to truth are actually attempts at domination. But like those early sophists, they leave us with the sense that every claim to truth is a matter of perspective and power. Some post-structuralists um, have recently countered the charge that by undermining the concept of truth, they bear some responsibility for climate change denial or the thoroughgoing mendacity of the Trump uh, administration. The only person who's actually uh, done a mea culpa on that is uh, Bruno Latour. But most of them reply that post-structuralism simply seeks to describe reality, not to orient it. But post-structuralism often obscures the line between descriptive and normative statements, imbuing description with a faintly normative air. It can't be surprising that less subtle readers hear their statements as prescriptions and conclude that if it, there are any facts at all, they are facts about domination. Now, most of us know from our own lives, when we're not repeating this ideology that's constantly being you know, uh, blasted at us. We know from our own lives that all three worldviews are false. Even social psychologists have sh shown that as soon as we cross the poverty line, our happiness does not consist in consumption. We often act from love or faith or honor in ways that have nothing to do with the reproduction of our tribes. And we make and defend statements because we have good reasons to believe them. Not always, of course, but we have enough ordinary counterexamples to those worldviews to be able to call them into question. In fact, it's hard to think of anyone who consistently acts according to those views with perhaps one exception. I think Donald Trump embodies all three ideologies. Uh, his claims to truth are nothing but assertions of power. His values are all material values, and he appears to care about nothing so much as reproducing as many copies of himself, or at least his name, as possible. But fortunately, the theories that describe this peculiar man can't be attributed to the rest of humankind. Most of us are differently constructed, though the omnipresence of the reigning ideologies makes many embarrassed to express other values out loud. If those beliefs are the reigning faces of universalism, is it any wonder that tribal ideologies have reemerged? For nationalism does appeal to emotions of love and loyalty and honor, emotions that go unanswered by the reigning globalist ideology. Even as it may pervert those emotions and restricts them to members of a smallish group, nationalism serves emotional needs that globalism ignores. I'm sure those of you who've been struggling and hungry will have more to say about nationalism and needs, but I'd like to say something more about the German case, in particular the well-documented claim that our nationalist party has proportionally more voters in the East. All of its leadership is from the West, interestingly enough, but the former East German states have voted in higher proportions, if lower real numbers, for the AFD. As an explanation for this disparity, uh, many have doubled down on a common claim that East Germany never had a proper Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, that living in one dictatorship, they simply traded one dictatorship for another, and they need re-education. This is so false, uh, that it has to count as fake news. But since it is very common, I want to address the differences between the East and West German ways of facing the past. There is one sense in which this claim is true. As a former East German pointed out to me, for Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung really is a West German concept. It's more psychological than political. It involves, crucially, a personal reckoning with the experience of Nazism among families. What East Germany had was anti-fascism, a political attitude which was foundational for the state. 
It's often forgotten that the Nazis' first victims were communists and social democrats. While they were outlawed and persecuted from the moment the Nazis took power in 1933, the racial laws persecuting Jews weren't passed until 1936. Anti-Bolshevism was more fundamental to Nazi ideology than was anti-Semitism. What that meant is that once the war was over, the leaders of the GDR were men who had been in concentration camps or in exile, and they were committed anti-fascists in their bones and their blood. So the official GDR narrative was simple. We are the other Germany, anti-fascists from the start. And while it was, of course, no more true for the majority of the citizens, it was actually true for the cultural and political leadership. And on every conceivable measure, the East Germans did a better job of repudiating the Nazis than their West German relations. There were far more trials of Nazi criminals with mo m uh, much more harder sentences, far more monuments devoted to their victims, the school books were rewritten, the concentration camps were turned into educational centers that were well-funded, well-archived, and that every school child remembered visiting. There were more television f films about the Nazis. There was even a new national anthem rising from the ruins, um, which I find appropriate and moving. These are facts that are rarely doubted, and if you doubt them, I can tell you that I have fact-checked this chapter of the book and had two different historians go over it more than any other. Um, but the interesting thing is the West German response to them, if they respond to the facts at all, is to say that the East Germans had verordneter antifascismus, um, anti-fascism by decree or anti-fascism from above. I find it a very strange claim, especially since it's often made by the West Germans who rightly complain that West, the West German government was far too slow in rooting out Nazis from within. So wasn't it right to decree that the 17 million Germans left in the Soviet zone should reject fascism rather than see themselves as the war's primary victims? But nevertheless, knowing all this, I interviewed a fair number of East Germans just to find out how they had experienced this so-called decreed fa anti-fascism. And with one exception, all the people that I interviewed were members of the GDR opposition, that is, people who had risked quite a lot to work for democracy from within, and so we're hardly averse to criticizing the former government. All of them said that while they had many criticisms of the East German government, its anti-fascism, including its active attempts to, at reconciliation with Poland and the Soviet Union, was the one thing it did right. The East German government uh, made, I think it's grievous, its most uh, grave mistake by instrumentalizing its anti-fascism as an excuse for its own repressive measures like building the wall, which they called uh, the anti-fascist protection wall, and it was completely ridiculous. It also suggested that all the old Nazis were in West Germany, and though a, a majority of them were, it's certainly not true that all of them were there. So in so doing, it undercut its own position, but this is hardly reason to support the view that Nazism and communism are two sides of the same coin, a view encapsulated in the reference, common today in Germany and elsewhere, to the two German dictatorships. An opinion that the famous Historiker Streit, the historian's debate in the 1980s, thoroughly rejected. Um, to be sure, the German democratic government was democratic only in name. The media was heavily censored. Uh, <coughs> the borders were closed and elections were a national joke. But once you equate the GDR with Nazi Germany, everything about the GDR is poisoned. Much like the 1950s uh, tendency in the United States to describe communism as a malevolent disease, it moves the discourse from the political to the pathological. And this leaves no room for any discussion 
of uh, political principles and practices, all you can do with diseases is get rid of them. The international drive to equate fascism and communism is not just a problem for understanding 20th century history. How we remember the past constrains the possibilities we consider for the future. If communism is painted black, neoliberalism has won. And any appeal to solidarity or human motives other than the endless competition neoliberals view as natural will be read as a call for the gulag. There's no subject that ignites argument between East and West Germans like comparing their respective ways of facing the Nazi past. Each side charges the other was missing the genuine article. I am gearing up a bit for the discussions I'm going to have when the book comes out in German in March. I have a theory about why West Germans are so reluctant to acknowledge the seriousness of East German anti-fascism. I don't think it's a conscious attitude, but that makes its effect even stronger. Few Wehrmacht soldiers were moved to take up arms in order to mow down Jewish civilians, though few disobeyed the orders to do so once they were behind the front lines. But no dictatorship ever gets far by merely commanding its troops. It has to inspire them. The heroic ethos the Nazis cultivated would not have been served by exhorting recruits to shoot long-bearded old men or bayonet babies. Those acts took place, but they were never advertised. The call to defend Europe from the communist menace was loud, clear, and far more effective. Sometimes communists were depicted with the same hooked noses that graced characters of fat bankers, as every student of Nazi propaganda has noted. But especially after the war began in earnest, the emphasis was less on the Jewish and more on the Bolshevik menace. After the tide turned at Stalingrad, the call to defend home and family from the Soviets wasn't even propaganda, for it was clear that the Red Army would not end its answer to the German invasion until it entered the gates of Berlin. No one in Germany doubts that anti-Semitism polluted most of the air left to breathe in those 12 poisoned years. But everyone in Germany knows that the heroic aura that still surrounds the Wehrmacht survivors and its fallen derives from its lost battle with the communist foe. Only right-wing forces actually assert it. Still, the lingering guilt few Germans can shake off could be assuaged by revamping Nazi anti-communism. Because Papa, or Grandpa, probably did not pick up his gun to kill helpless Jews. It was Bolsheviks he was after, and Jews were in the way. The worse the Bolsheviks now appear, the better the Nazis look in retrospect. If fascism and communism were both equally evil, weren't Papa and Grandpa fighting evil too? For what it's worth, uh, the last West German ambassador to East Germany agreed with me that this is the decisive reason for the equivalence between the so-called two dictatorships. There's still a deep unspoken need for exoneration from the Nazis. So if the larger proportion of Eastern voters who support the AFD are not proof that the East German government was no better than the Nazi one or that East Germans never learned the lessons of the past, what does explain the rise of the AFD in the East? The party plays on long-standing, often justified, East German resentment. Jokes about East Germans are still regularly told in circles that would never countenance an anti-Semitic or an anti Turkish joke, only one of many reasons that East Germans feel scorned. It's actually interesting because I am neither East or West German. Um, I hear things from both sides that neither of them would say to the other. And I have been shocked regularly by what I hear from West Germans about Easterners. Uh, the socio sociologist Nike Foraton, director of the Humboldt University's Institute for Integration and Migration Studies, has actually observed similar preju prejudice towards East Germans and immigrants and feels that both are still treated as second-class citizens. 
the discrepancy between East and West pensions, which are calculated on the basis of lifetime salaries, is one absolutely central source of resentment. Uh, since rent, food, transportation, and culture were all heavily subsidized in East Germany, East German salaries were low, and its citizen had, citizens had neither reason nor opportunity to save for retirement. And now pensioners in the East are raging at refugees who receive state support. The AFD has succeeded in exploiting that rage and giving some East Germans that thin sense of self-respect that's so often built on denigrating others. The East was barely visible until it moved to the right, wrote one East German author. Um, <coughs> her hometown, Leipzig, was splendidly renovated after the country was unified, but 94% of the beautiful restored old buildings belong to the Westerners. And 1.7% of all leadership positions in the East, and when I say leadership, I don't just mean government, I mean university, I mean media, I mean companies, 1.7% uh, are held by East Germans. <coughs> Uh, Hensel rejects the West German claim that right-wing tendencies in East Germany result from the GDR's supposed failure to work off the Nazi past, and I quote, that claim is a projection. West Germans cannot imagine the omnipresence of anti-fashion in the GDR, even in my generation, she was born in the 70s, because they had nothing comparable. The era that needs working off, it's been argued, is the era just after reunification, when contempt for East Germans and disregard for their memories created resentment that has only grown since the 1990s. And that contempt has produced a picture of the East in the Western media that fuels an Eastern tendency to regard and dismiss every traditional uh, Western media report as Lügenpresse, fake news, because their picture of the East really, really doesn't correspond to reality. All right. Um, I was very pleased to be part of a series entitled Reasons for Hope. And you may wonder after what I've said uh, what reasons for hope I can offer. Here's the first. The very slowness of West Germany in particular to face its Nazi past leaves hope for those struggling to, to force their own nations to face theirs. I found this particularly true in the United States where people I've spoken with all concluded if even the Nazis needed time and trouble to acknowledge their crimes, it's no wonder that other nations are slow in doing so. It's no wonder that any attempt to acknowledge those parts of our history that cause us shame are met with a backlash by conservatives uh, who argue that we're tearing up the fabric of society and destroying national identity. This is what happened in Germany and it's happening in the US today. But there is a Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung beginning in America, set in motion largely by reaction to the presidency of Donald Trump, which forced many white Americans to realize how deep white supremacy reaches in American history, as shown by the fact that the term white supremacy itself, which about two years ago was confined to departments of post-colonial studies, is now readable in the New York Times. So facing the past is hard. And the other reason for hope is that despite all the foot dragging and difficulty in doing so, Germany has become a much better place for having done so. You can feel it on the street. I want to end by quoting a man named Brian Stevenson, one of the heroes of my book. Um, Stevenson is an African-American lawyer who has saved many people from death row. And through his work to um, abolish the death penalty, he traveled to Germany where he became aware of the ways in which Germans have faced up to the Nazi period, and he conceived of the National Lyn Lynching Memorial and Museum in Alabama. It is truly the most awesome memorial I have ever seen in my life. You might have seen pictures of it, but they don't do it justice. 
It remem it's worth going to Montgomery for. I mean, maybe not from Vienna, but like if you're in sort of the east coast of the United States, it's really worth a trip. Um, the monument remembers the thousands of lynchings that the Equal Justice Initiative, the organization Stevenson founded, has documented. And it has two parts. Inside are hanging columns uh, with the names of each person who was lynched county by county. Outside are identical columns, which each county is invited to take back in order to um, change the iconography of the country. Stevenson said he was influenced um, by, in that part of the monument, uh, by the stumbling stones, which you may have seen in Germany. Every couple of miles in the south is a monument to one Confederate battle or another. This. Uh, Soon they will have a monument to those men and women lyn lynched there as well. This is itself an important task, but Stevenson wants something more. As he said to me when I interviewed him, there are white people in the South who oppose slavery and lynching, and you don't know their names. And the fact that you don't know their names is a problem that says everything we need to know. Translated, Nations need to remember their heroes as well as their victims. And if the wrong heroes have been valorized, it doesn't mean that we need to do away with heroes or that we live in a post-heroic age, as some have argued. We need to seek better ones. It's not too hard to do in the US where there's a strong tradition of the other America, though it's less remembered in public monuments than it should be. I'm convinced that every country has its heroes, people who resisted injustice in word and deed, and of whom we can be proud while also feeling shame for the injustice they had to endure. I believe that a grown-up relation to our countries is like a grown-up relation to our parents. When you're a child, you have no choice but to believe every word your parents said. What basis did you have for comparison? That fact often leads some of us as adolescents to reject, in turn, everything our parents told us. But a healthy relationship to your parents, as well as to your nation, is neither one or the other. You need to sift through all the ideas and values you received at a time when you were too young to question them, and decide which ones you want to make your own and pass on to the next generation, and which ones you want to reject. It's a process that's slow, but it's possible, and it's always worthwhile, like growing up itself. Thank you.